aware of the risk or worried about it, they're rushing to do their homework. They'll often take this stuff and do it, God knows where at work. I've had students tell me, I was at work at my bank, I started doing their hacking, my hacking homework there, and I'm like, and they got mad at me, and I'm like, dude. You join his homework, so I downloaded Kane, and then the phone rang. What are you doing out there, kid? Knock it off. Like, that's pretty good. That's what never monitoring is supposed to do. All right. What idiot is trying to hack the bank? Anyway, um, so in here you will see some strings, uh, whatever's in this executable. And here you see uh, some Microsoft modules, like sleep and create process A. Microsoft modules often have a capital A at the end or a capital W, depending on whether they were in ASCII or in 16 bit words. And they often have EX or even EX, EX because they're extended and maybe extended, extended because Microsoft has so many versions of everything. Um, so you get to spot these Microsoft terms like create, new text, and close handle. And that gives you some clue what this malware does. So this malware, obviously, has some sleep function, but oh wait, these are the functions actually put in by the malware developers. It's got a sleep function and a hello function. Then it's going to create a mutex. Mutexes are important. Mutexes are used for inter-process communication. They are handles that are visible to more than one program. So if you are going to use a resource and you want to make sure that no other process tries to use the same resource at the same time, you make a mutex. And malware authors very often use them because it is a way to mark the system as owned. One of the things malware usually does is when you first run the infector, it checks to see if this machine is already infected. In that case, don't bother trying to infect it again. And typically it does that with a mutex, which is a handle in, in the uh, machine it can see. So I have a little bit of clue what the malware is doing for here. Um, and you can adjust, uh, change the minimum text length to four and see more of it. And down here you'll see exec, which is the command that the bad guy uses to uh, Bring it out. All right. Anyway, um, if you look for further down the strings, you'll see some more suspicious stuff. Find file and find first file, find next file. Uh, what this malware does is it hunts through the file system for something. And if it finds it, it will do something with it. And if it doesn't find it, it will do something else. And that's another clue it uses to tell if the machine is already infected. If you just look at the strings of simple things, you can often find useful things. This one's really useful. Um, that's one of the files it creates. Current e 132dl In see Windows 32 to look like kernel 32, which is the Windows kernel. This is also very common. Both the names of files, the names of registry keys, the names of running processes for malware tend to look very close to a legitimate Microsoft name. So as to hopefully confuse people, make them afraid of deleting that file. Um, so this is a pretty good clue that it's going to create this file. And that file now serves as both another thing you want to investigate and as an indicator of compromise. If you, I read the Demandian Intrusion Detection book. I taught that class once, and I'll be teaching it again at City College in a few more semesters. And what they say is, this is something the old forensics would start by taking a whole disk image. So you'd have 500 gigabytes of stuff, and then hunt through it with special tools. But if you're an enterprise, you're infected, there are 10,000 machines. You're not going to take 10,000 hard disk images. What are you, crazy? That would take a year. What you want is you want a fast way to tell if this box is compromised. So you watch for things like this, and then you write a custom tool, which really is not much more than just a script in Bash or PowerShell, PowerShell or uh, could be Bash these days, actually. But anyway, PowerShells. Are, uh, and it just looks for the specific things you look for, a certain registry key, a certain listening network socket, a certain process, a certain file. And then you can quickly run this tool on every machine, and you don't have to wait months to get the answer in a matter of hours or so. We'll get a list of all machines that have indicators. So those things are super important. Things that well, you'll find on an infected box that you won't find on an innocent box. Anyway, uh, so dependency walker is another really useful tool. And again, it has a legitimate purpose for software development. The point of this is, especially you guys use Windows 98, I'm sure you remember you launched the same thing you use all the time. It says, can't open missing ms7453.dll. Mm -hmm. And then you cry, and you have to hunt through these tab files and try to find it. And when you put it back, it's gone again next week. Um, so this is what this is supposed to solve. If your software you wrote needs something that's not there, this shows you all the dependencies. And this is um, part of the structure of Microsoft operating systems. Linux Microsoft systems typically use static linking. So if I have one program that uses network sockets, it connects to a network library, 
and it compiles it into the program. If I have another program that also uses network socket, it's made a second copy of network socket library and loads it here. If I run 10 programs that all use networks, I have 10 copies of the library loaded in RAM. Now the point of this is these programs are portable across versions of Linux, and they don't want to make any assumptions about which version of Linux you're using. This is safer and more sanitary than the Microsoft method, which is to share libraries. That's dynamic linking, that's what these DIL files are, this isn't the heart of Microsoft. So if I load a program and it wants to use networking, it looks to see is there already a copy of that library in RAM from some other program. If there is, just to use that library, you'll both share it. That makes programs launch faster, it makes them lose, use less RAM, makes the whole thing more efficient, but it's unsanitary. Because now you add code to a running process that didn't come from the author and didn't come from that code. So almost all infections of Microsoft operating systems involve tricking you to loading the wrong deal or modifying a deal. Um, so here, this lab 101 fake malware uses kernel32.dil and msvcrt.dil. And if you click one of these, you can see over here the exact strings it uses. And here it uses string I compare. So it's going to go through the file system, <coughs> find first file, find next file, one next file, then it's going to compare them to some file name it's looking for and decide whether it's found the file name it needs. You can guess that for once here. All right. And here is more of it. If you go to kernel32.dil, you can see uh, which particular kernel32 routines it uses. And as you see, it creates uh, find first file, find next file, and so on. Uh, this is part of the individual functions it runs to hunt through the file system. All right. So here is um, the DIL file. The, the malware that we analyzed here included both a um, executable file and its own library. But its own library just uses more Microsoft libraries, of course. Uh, this is what you normally do if you're a developer. Uh, same thing I do with Python. You do everywhere why bother writing anything when it's already in a library. All you do is call the libraries to do all the work as much as possible. It's certainly the right thing to do. Anyway, so here, this is the Berkeley Standard Networking Library. This is the stuff that's been around since long before Windows. This is what created the internet. You'll see these in every language. This is the low-level network sockets, which most developers do not bother using. Most developers use higher level functions that load from an HTTP URL all at once. But if you want to, you can connect the sockets with this same stuff when I do it in Python all the time, connect, accept, bind. This is how you open a raw socket for networking. So that's apparently what this malware does. This malware does some kind of networking and it does some kind of creating process and creating new tags. So you can get some clue what it does here. Just by looking at the names of the routine it calls. You do not get to see the assembly code. You don't see exactly what the arguments are. So although I know it hunts through the file system and it compares some strings, I can't find the name of the string it compares it to, although it's one of those strings I saw here in the tool. So this is how, like I say, you're looking at clues that fill on the outside of a box. Uh, you can get some idea what's going on here, and sometimes you get one. And I have a couple of challenges here where people hunt through some other malware and find some things just to show they have practice with it. And the next thing is unpacking. So that's the basic, simplest static techniques. Now, a lot of people pack malware, both to make it smaller, like you might ship it, and also to hide it from any virus engines. And one thing I've heard for years on the forums is there are some standard uh, packers, but you, they are uh, Russian forums you can go to and pay like 30 bucks and they'll write you a custom pack. And I found a nice uh, article about how to do that in Python. It's really very easy. I'll probably get my students that for home so they get to work and that'd be a lot of fun. It, but it, how hard can it be? There's a cute article about this where they made XOR encoding where you code the first byte and then you take the output as the key for the next byte, the next byte, the next byte. So it's not got a fixed key and it shows you exactly how to write that packer and write that unpacker and add it to the front of the file. And all you got to do is some simple thing like that. Just scramble the bits a little bit in some way that is not a standard commercial product and there's no real way any virus can catch it. As soon as I started trying to sneak malware past any virus, I found out that what I've been told is entirely true. It is extremely easy. The very first trick you try will work. Antivirus is a very, very weak defense. But it will stop things where someone sends a million of identical files to all these people. Anyway, so you look at the strings in this thing, and uh, you don't see any. This is one clue of packed files. You'll see almost nothing. The only strings you see are from the unpacker. The actual malware itself is all scrambled in some way. And this one, if you look at a PEID, and they actually used a commercial unpacker, 
This is an open source one called UPX. It'll actually leave some names. It names the sections UPX1, UPX2, and that's a clue. It does not put a string down here where you label the name of the thing for creating files that Microsoft Visual C++ does, but it does leave clues that are found by this tool. So you can tell it's packed with the UPX Packer, which is a common open source packer. Now, if you examine it with PE View to see the portable executable section, you'll see the point. In it. This is what UPX does. It breaks up the sections in UPX or UPX1 and UPX2. Uh, these are the little sections that will be used to reconstruct a file when you unpack it. And this is the start of the unpacker. All Windows executables start with MZ, and then they have this message this program cannot be run in DOS mode. Uh, you'll see that at the beginning of every EXE. So you can download and run UPX. It runs on Windows in a command line, and you can unpack files with it. So uh, there's your file. Just unpack it. You'll make level 102 unpacked with it. So the original file was 3 kilobytes. The unpacked file is 16 kilobytes. Malware tends to be small, by the way. It's very rare for it to be as large as one megabyte. To compensate for that, malware is almost always staged, where the original bit does a little bit and downloads some more and runs some more and that downloads some more and eventually gets commands over the internet or something. So you're not limited by the functionality of what you can do in just a little code. And now that you've unpacked it, it now says <coughs> you should in Microsoft Visual C++. Because the inside file is just a C++ file. So now that you've got the unpacked file to analyze, you can now observe it in dependency walker. And here you'll see this did not use those Berkeley standard sockets of accept and bind and connect, which force you to do every little bit of the network handshake yourself. They use the higher level functions in WinINet, which is what most developers use, things like Internet Open URL and Internet Open Ed, where you can just download a file with one command and a URL instead of having to open a socket, send a SYN, take the SYN after the handshake yourself, which is, you know, you'd have to be kind of nuts to do all that. Um, that's why these higher level libraries are what most legit developers use. And the bad guys use the other ones just to confuse you. Anyway, uh, you can look at strings in the unpacked file, and here you'll see a URL and a service, and you can get a clue what this thing does. It's going to run a service. It's going to call it now service, and that's going to phone home to this command and control center. Almost every piece of malware has a command and control center. You can often spot them as simply as just looking at strings. You can spot them even more, easy, even more easily by deliberately infecting a box and watching a Wireshark to see where it tries to go. And this is how uh, Stephen Hutchins became the hero. He, when the British hospitals got infected with WannaCry, and it froze them with the ransomware, so they had to divert patients to emergency rooms. He asked on Twitter, same place I would go, if one of his buddies had a sample, he got a sample from one of his buddies, he ran it in a virtual machine, and tried to go to a domain. The domain didn't exist. So without any further analysis, he bought the domain. And he discovered experimentally that the presence of that domain turned off the malware. And he saved a lot of American lives that way. Because before business hours appeared in America, he had stopped wanting to cry for doing any harm. And it would have frozen our hospitals too. Um, so, and everybody's pointing fingers at everybody. This was another exploit that the Russians stole and leaked. They stole it from the NSA. So Microsoft officially blamed the NSA for hiding vulnerabilities from them. But they had been tipped off secretly. Probably uh, nobody knows how, but I imagine probably someone in the NSA did tell them. When they found out the Russians had stolen it and they were going to dump it, they told Microsoft. So there was a patch up for about a month before this malware came out. And so a lot of people say it's their fault for not patching. But I think you people here are kind of experienced as to why people don't patch. They got hospital equipment that's big, expensive stuff. It often doesn't have any way to patch. A bunch of it's still running Windows XP. Microsoft did, in fact, make a Windows XP patch for this. But in fact, especially lately, I think we've all noticed how lousy Microsoft patches. It's a problem. I think right now, my, I read an article Microsoft patched and emergency patches for their products 15 days in the last 30. And there are four of them that had patches on the patches, and three of them are still broken, and they need patches on the patches and the patches. So if you're running like life-sustaining hospital equipment, you can't possibly have a policy to just install a new patch as soon as possible. Yeah. Didn't they arrest the patches? Isn't there what? Didn't they, they arrest, arrest him? him? Yes, they did. They did arrest him. And um, at first, all the, they arrested him coming out of DEF CON. Um, and at the first, a bunch of hackers had a knee-jerk reaction saying, how dare they take on this guy? He's a good guy. Today, Brian Krebs wrote an analysis of his past, which is pretty damn. 
Before this, he spent years as a typical strip kitty selling malware to people, stealing credit card numbers, you know, doing all the bad stuff they do. Before he went straight, I've seen this myself. Um, I was involved, involved in a few law enforcement actions on the edges. Um, there was a guy named Agent 48 or Agent 52 or something, <laughs> and he hacked everybody for like five or six years. Then suddenly he said, okay, I'm going straight. And in two months, he started publishing fiction novels under his real name. <laughs> and putting them online. And then the FBI arrested him. And people said, you told the FBI who he was. And I said, I didn't have to tell the FBI who he was. I probably would have, but I, I, he's an idiot. And this guy's the same. He thinks, well, I'm clean now. But he doesn't know that what you did five years ago, that's still locked in. <laughs> anyway, and, and he said, and I have you know, credits on these articles on forums of his friends warning him, dude, you changed your name, but there's still these connections to your old name. You, if you're going to hide, you've got to hide better. And he's like, ah, it'll be fine. Well, it's not going to be fine. As you all know, the internet anonymity is pretty much a farce. You think you're hiding who you are, and that is nearly impossible. On the internet, there are plenty of ways to track. And what typically happens with all these guys, and that's what happened with him, is he was only 15 or 14 when he started. So he was just doing all sorts of stuff without any, any clue about the consequences. And then he ended up doing really bad stuff and making money off of crime. And then he sort of straightened out and quit that. But he didn't bother to really change his name completely and remove all links to this name or that name. Because you start out as just a gamer, you make some website about games, you register with your real name, then you make some other account that you use crime, and you make a new account, you make a new account, but you don't really change everything all at all once, like going to witness protection. You can really break a trail between your new identity and your old identity. So they get caught all the time. Anyway, so that's the second bit of static analysis. Then I had a couple of challenges where people have to go through some other files and find them. Um, then there's basic dynamic analysis. And I should be able to show you some of this stuff live. Let's see which one I've got here. So um, the one I want to show you is the keylogger. I think it's coming up in the next one. All right, so here's Lab03. This thing is going to um, import kernel 32. And um, if you use strings, you see registry keys in this one. Software, classes, HTTP, open commands, and here's more. Microsoft registry keys. Uh, registry is one of the most common ways to achieve resistance.
and you can't just stop it and have it go away. You have to kill it with this process. First, I have to kill BMX 3264, which sounds like some kind of driver or something, but that's intentional. This is actually malware. So I have to kill process. Are you sure? Yes, I'm sure. Okay. There, it's gone. It turned red for a second and it's gone. Okay, now that it's gone, now I can delete this file. See Windows System 32. And uh, the simplest way is in my command prompt. So I go right here and delete. I think it's Dell in Windows. Yeah. Either way. Oh, good. Okay. Okay. I'm real clumsy at Windows. Okay, now supposedly I've gotten rid of it. So, um, so let's run Process Explorer. And by the way, you can see handles here. Um, but first, let me start all my tools. All right. So I want to run, um, okay, Process Explorer, Wireshark, and Process Mom. So let's run Wireshark. I was not there, well, that's all right, Wire. Wireshark, I hope you guys are used to this. This is the open source packet sniffing tool, um, generally the standard everybody uses. And since I'm running a virtual machine, I have to give permission from the host to sniff. So now I'm sniffing for network traffic. And since I'm using a virtual machine in that mode, which is what I highly recommend, there is no traffic except generated by me. I don't have to sort through all the other people in the room, the email and stuff. All right, then process monitor, which is another Marcus Innovator tool, which is not, a, not an accident. I mean, the, uh, well, I got to type process. There, yeah, process monitor. Um, you may remember the Sony root kit. I mean, Mike Markersinovich bought some music, put it on his machine, and he looks at it, wait, that's a rootkit. It's just obvious to him like a fly landing on the screen. And the rest of us, it's not that obvious because he wrote these tools. He knows what's really going on in Windows more than anybody, I think. And if one thing is wrong, he immediately spots it. And these tools make it possible for us to do some of that ourselves. So this thing here is Project Monitor. What this thing is going to do is watch the Windows browser, and it's going to filter the event log. So, um, Filters were in effect. Let's try OK and see what happens. Oh, good. All right, I've already got it filtered. See, normally, if I turn off the filters, you'll see thousands of events here. And in fact, down here, you can see 102,000 events have gone by in the few seconds this thing has been over. This tool and Wireshark are somewhat dangerous to run in the following sense. They are stupid, and they will use up all the RAM and crash your game. So if you just want Wireshark, well, you can't like use Wireshark to do 24-7 network monitoring. It will just die. You have to use command line tools like TCP dump for that that are smart enough to store only a certain amount of file, get it in this file, and then have a ring buffer for your series of files so it doesn't use up all the room, all your RAM, or all the room on your hard disk. So now it's up to 106,000 events. I've already manually excluded by process name all the existing processes on this box, of which there are about 30. Right click and remove by process name. I was horrified when I first saw this because what if the malware uses the same process name? That could certainly happen. But remember, we're just trying to take the fastest route to the answer. We're running on a compromised operating system. We're willing to make sloppy assumptions to get to the answer faster. So, uh, not much of anything is passing through all my filters, and so now I can run my malware. Uh, once I've got all my monitoring tools running, and here's what you do. If you see all this junk, you just right-click and exclude by name until you've excluded everything by name. And all these links, by the way, are from my homepage, sanchclass.info, so this stuff is all available if you want it. Anyway, now I run lambo301.exe. So let's go down here and get to my desktop, where I've got my malware samples that I got from the textbook. And the great thing about these is none of them are too bad. These will not spread. These will not do any real harm to your box. Some of them are a little hard to remove. But that's why I can safely give them to students, and they can go do the memory right there, at home and everything, you know, all day and up in jail. So, <laughs> run it here. Okay. And when I do, we should see some action in Process Monitor and some action in Process Explorer. Okay. So now, Process Monitor has caught some stuff. I'm going to stop it. For some ungodly reason, the magnifying glass is what stops it. I would have thought that would be searched or something, but what do I know? So now, Here's the things that Labo301.exe did, and it is very, very nice. You can just see what the malware did, step by step. So, um, this task engine thing did something. I don't care about that. Here it is. Start the process, create a thread. Then it does some kind of query for a name, load an image. It creates a file. It opens a key, session manager, 
it goes more opening keys, query keys, close keys, open keys, and on it goes. Then it loads an image. Then it creates a file. So you know, you can see what it does here. And uh, let me go back to my instructions and find the particular spots that are most illuminating to see here. Um, okay, first let's start with Process Explorer. Process Explorer has Labo 3010E running in it now. Just the file I ran there. Now it launched to Explorer because I went and browsed to it and launched it as me. So it's running with my privileges. So that's all right. Now, in the lower pane view here, we see some files it uses and other information about this process. And if we go down here, let me make this better. There, there's a mute. So it creates this thing called WinVMX32. That's a mutant. That mutant tells the other, if I try to relaunch the malware on this system, that mutant will tell it this box is already there. So that's one clue. All right. Uh, now if I view the DILs, I can see that it's using networking. Um, if I go to view, lower pane view, DILs. It will show me the libraries that this malware uses. And WHTCPIP, WSH, HTPIP is the one that makes TCPIP connections. And there it is right at the bottom. That's WinSock. You may remember the ultimate collection of WinSock software. Uh, this is a basic networking library used by all that stuff. And it's got it too, so that tells me this malware is probably making network connections someplace, like phoning home through a command and control server. It's typically what it might be doing. But that, so I have some clues about the running processes just from that. Now the next thing is process monitor. And um, uh, there, I wanted to see these things. The interesting things here are where it writes this file and where it makes this run. And you can filter for them more, but I can probably just spot them here. Write file and the run key. Uh, let's go to process monitor. Okay. Uh, Ah, too much bother. Okay, I'm going to filter it. So. Uh, okay, I filter it here. And two more filters operation of red set value and operation of right file. Okay, the filters are here. And I'm going to do operation of red set value. You don't have to type in here, you'll find the available operations in a list. So here's red set value. So include that. And if the operation is Create right file. Okay, right file. I want to include that. Which is the last one. Okay. And then apply that. And now I get down to just the two things I wanted to see, which are the things I had already guessed from our much sloppier previous tools. Um, is this stuff writes that file, VMX32 to 64, and it puts a run key called video drive which is what relaunches every time you start the machine. And both of those are doing their best to look like a harmless system process. So that's the joy of that. And the last one is Wireshark. Let's take a look and see what Wireshark is picking up. Okay, it's been picking up some traffic here, Dropbox and all sorts of hogwash. One of my favorite um, tools I learned from the Wireshark 101 book, and the Wireshark certification I went and got, uh, was uh, this one, Frame Contains. A string of any type, like now. Any string that's readable in the frame, this will hunt for it. And it's not catching any here, which is pretty rude. Somehow I failed to get the beacons. But anyway, I'm not going to struggle with it. Um, it the malware should be Coney home. Um, and it's not running right on my demonstration box here, but anyway, that's the point. You'll see it. Um, if you get it running right, you'll see it phoning home. By the way, I should mention this is fairly common that when you run malware, you don't get the right answer because either it's smart enough to notice it's in a virtual machine, which is not very hard to spot. You can just look at the name of the network adapter or any other clues that you're in a virtual machine, um, and it won't do the right thing there. Or you look for something else. One fairly common thing is language settings. Um, there's a lot of malware that only attacks people in certain languages. We avoid have hacking your friends. Yeah. On that point, uh, what are the malefactors doing with people virtualizing virtually as many aspects of their environment, if they're simply going to shut down when they detect a VM, you know, is there going to come a point where they're going to have to solve that problem? Yes, I think there will be. And that's why I think you have two general types of malware. There's malware trying to get endpoints. 
and now we're trying to get a church. Um, but if, and not too many people, I think are using virtual anymore too. But it is, it is a big issue. And uh, what it means is, of course, just like legitimate software, as we keep changing these things, the old software is going to stop working. We'll have to write new software that includes these features. So, right, I don't have any specific knowledge but, but by families, but you're certainly right. How would you feel about an enterprise that chose to do virtual endpoints as a standard? Yeah. Well, like anything else, it's security through obscurity. If you do something that most other people aren't doing, that will lower your risk for a little while for a until they catch up. For a little while. Yeah, I mean, I know I knew people used to want to run like IPX, SPX on their land, right? Because, of course, the malware is not written for that environment because who would target that kind of environment? So, that you can certainly do things like that, and it will give you some safety for a while. But as soon as it becomes popular, bad guys will work attack that too. Sure, it's spy versus spy, you yeah, know, farmer versus town. Yeah. So, I mean, I wouldn't make a decision based on the resistance to malware, I made the decision on other factors like, you know, lower tech support and all that jazz, and also better security since all the data is really on the server. Right, so if they detect the endpoint, it won't still the server, things like that. Yeah, you made a comment about um, most antivirus isn't very good. Well, it, what's it, your approach now then? Well, I, I install antivirus at the company, but really, at the college, really, I do it in the spirit of compliance. Like, you know, we got we got some Macs. I want some Macs in our, in our hacking. It might be enough with PCs for years. So I finally brought in a Mac. They said, okay, we'd like to let you use this Mac. The policy says it has to be locked. And all we have is this padlock, and we lock the key. I said, oh, that's fine. We don't want a big lock. So I picked the lock. Locked it up and locked it up. And there, are you happy now? I said, well, um, uh, well, it's locked. And they leave. So that's compliance. So I put on antivirus so I can tell them, of course we have antivirus, what do you think you are stupid? But I don't expect it to really do any good. I mean, it will stop, I guess if people click on links and spam, it will stop some of that. But uh, you know, I think people say the current tests show the current amount of stuff stopped by antivirus is like 3% of the attacks. 3%? Yeah. So it's it's pathetic. And the, yeah. this is, by the way, is not because antivirus researchers are stupid, it's because of the intrinsic difficulty of the task. Um, <coughs> All you have to do is modify the software a little bit, and the signature won't match. Now, they try to use heuristic detection, but heuristic detection has to fail. Because what you do is you run it, you can't run it, you can't wait for long. You're basically launching a virtual machine, some kind of sandbox. You wait maybe five seconds to see if it does something bad. If it, if it, un if it unzips and launches more files, if you call that a virus, then all kinds of normal zipped good files will be blocked. And so it turns out, that any heuristic sensitivity has to be set very low where you start having false positives. And nobody wants false positives. The legitimate software you need is blocked by your antivirus. That's it. That's a nobody will put up with that. So the sensitivity of the heuristic tests is always set so low that it's useless. And the only thing it could possibly spot is an attacker sent an identical file to a million boxes. And very few people are stupid enough to do that. That's as stupid as using a non-standard network. There was once a time when you could see traffic on port 31337, and that was back orifice, like in the 90s. But it didn't take too long for everyone to figure out, just put your traffic on port 80 and port 443, and they won't be able to tell it from all the other traffic. So, you know, it's, you're only going to stop the dumbest attackers with it. However, that's something, you know, like the lock on your door is ridiculous. American locks are garbage. My students learn to pick them in half an hour. They can pick any lock you find in America. You can't sell these locks in Germany. The Germans are as stupid as Americans. But anyway, we still use these locks because they will stop some attackers. It's just something most people don't realize that the difference between the highly skilled attacker that can get through your front door and the guy that can't do it is the highly skilled attacker tried and practiced to have that. That's all it is. That's all it takes. I read a description how to pick locks in Feynman's autobiography, and I got a bent paper clip and picked a lock in my office in like 10 minutes. It is, you know, if you've never picked a lock, it just means you've never tried. It's a whole lot easier than an auto because they were never approved since 1850. Yeah. So you raised two more questions. Yeah. First of all, should we all go out and get German locks? Are they the best? Or, or you can go to, I've got a link on my page to, so there are some American locks that are actually good. Okay. And uh, they don't even necessarily part. cost a lot more. But okay. they, for some reason, there's no tradition yet of rating them in any way or warning you. Um, so the real lock pickers uh, know how to do it. All the hacking conferences have lock picking groups, and Tool is the organization of lock picking sport, where they have competitive lock picking as a sport. And Shoebox on Twitter is Skylar Town. He's the best lock picker in the world. He's a professional uh, sport lock picker. And now he is a consultant for TV and movies. And you may not have noticed, but 
You may remember 15 years ago when old movies had ridiculous crap for computers like tinfoil and lights blinking and the back of a tape player was supposed to be the computer. And then suddenly their tools got better when they started hiring like real consultants to put up more realistic computers and more realistic hacking. Now they have realistic blocking. Um, before they used to have someone to jiggle something in there and then say you took the lock. Now, now they have someone teach them what it looks like when somebody actually takes the lock. So anyway, but I've got, I've got links I can give you for better locks. So the second question is, yeah. instead of running antivirus, which just is going to slow down the machine, should you just, should you just run anti-malware uh, like every three days? Or? <coughs> no, because you want real-time protection. I mean, antivirus gives you some real-time protection against some real threats. Mm -hmm. I, I, as an article of faith, mm -hmm. I suppose something's being stopped by antivirus, although personally, I don't think I'd bother using it in years. I never got infected anyway. Remember when Vista first came out, some Microsoft guy said I quit using antivirus? I pretty much quit too at that time, but I never got infected. It just depends on your high risk lifestyle. My sister had a Windows XP machine and she wiped it out four times a year so badly she had to flat. I finally found out what she was doing. She was watching current TV shows on the internet and she didn't know those were pirate sites. If you try to watch like tonight's episode of something on a computer, you get infected like hell. And so she switched to like Hulu or something legitimate and that never happened. I also bought her a Mac. But the um, <coughs> yeah, these these are good questions. I put on antivirus just so I can soothe people who still believe it. There was a survey about a year ago. They surveyed amateurs and professionals about what security measures they trust. And amateurs, the number one thing they trust is antivirus. And professionals, that's not even in the top ten. The number one thing they trust is updates. Yeah. Because of course, updates block a known attack that is being used. That's why they put out the updates. <laughs> Putting those on is usually a good thing. Unfortunately. When people don't make good quality updates, they create a problem for us all. <laughs> when you want to put on the update, but you don't really dare to. Anyway, let me see if I got any other good stuff. So, so that's this dynamic analysis part five. Um, so the keylogger, I'd like to show you that. This is a clean file. So here's what a keylogger looks like. There are several different ways to make keyloggers on Windows. But here's one. So I want to run Process Explorer and then launch Labo and launch the infected box. So I've still got Process Explorer running. I don't need Wireshark anymore. And I don't need Process Monitor, which is the one that draws. This one, good old Process Explorer. Okay. And let me fit this stuff on my screen a little better. Okay. And here, I'm going to run Labo 303, which is right there. So I'm going to shrink this down. Okay. Now we're going to zoom in so we can see it. So, that's the malware. I want you to watch over here. Now, when I, Lilo 301 is still running, that's that other thing. Um, but when I launch a process, it will appear here as a child of Process Explorer. And watch what happens when I launch this Lilo 303. Okay, it launches Lilo 303, and Lilo 303 launches a service host and then terminates and then leaves an orphaned process down here not owned by anyone. Now this is not normal. Up there is normal. Over here would be normal. Being down there is not normal. This is a process that lost its parent and remains as an orphan. And this is because it's a key log. It's logging all the keystrokes from every process on the machine and keeping a log of them. So if I open like notepad and I type in top secret stuff. Okay, that is actually appearing right here, practical malware analysis .login. the same folder that you launched it from. There's a log file and if you open it, it's got all my keystrokes and all my mouse clicks and everything else and somewhere at the bottom it's got top secret stuff, enter. That's the thing, that's the keylogger run. So let's take a look at how that keylogger works a little bit. And this is one cool thing in process replacement. So let's look at the properties of that strange SVC host process in Process Explorer. It is here. So I right click it and go to properties. Now here, Process Explorer is fantastic stuff, like everything you see in image does. And so what Process Explorer lets you do, it lets you see the strings in the running process. Now this is the strings in the disk file that connects to this process. So this has things like SVC host and so on. You can also look at the strings in the memory image. And if you do, you get completely different strings. 
So this is process replacement. This is extremely useful. What you do is another way to run malware on Windows. You launch the process, some harmless process, then while it's, then you pause it, rip out the guts, and put in different guts, and resume it. And Windows will just let that happen without complaining, and now you're running totally different stuff under a false name. Um, this turned out to be a way to defeat the campus administration, I discovered. A teacher wanted to teach a class, the administration wouldn't approve it. We just, uh, we're going to do this. We're going to run a different class under a different name, rip out the guts, and you're really going to teach this class. The boss will never know. We can get the job. Anyway, um, <laughs> so, this, this is process replacement, which is a useful trick. And you can tell it because the uh, initializing heat, not enough space, and all this jazz, various error messages, and so on. This is the keylogger process, which was in fact stored as a special section of the malware and loaded into a process after it launched. All right. So you can test it and see it logging things. You can kill them, and I made another version here where a student can run and have to find a log file which is hidden elsewhere uh, to get points. But uh, that was fun. All right. So Sam, yeah. as, as a full disclosure, I took your class, I guess it was last spring, asking these same questions. Yeah. You made me not sleep at night. We haven't gotten any better answers. I'm still not sleeping at night. Well, yeah, you get used to it. <laughs> <laughs> See, you know, to be fair, the world was never safe anymore. Anyway. You walk down the street, a car could hit you, some guy could come in and steal your wallet with a gun. We had those stupid plastic credit cards and these receipts and carbon copies everywhere people were stealing. You know, you were never that safe anyway. You know, maybe little kids think they're safe because they think their parents are protecting them. They don't realize that their parents are kind of not that powerful and not that brilliant, really. And they probably have an unnecessary amount of faith in their parents. So, you know, that's part of being a grown. There's yeah, you know, the problem is this room is full of systems administrators who are hired to keep us safe. Well, you're not giving us a real warm and fuzzy feeling. No, and this is. Can we get a refund? <laughs> 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 Your you team more this. This is what the point of network security monitor. To my new class, which is again a Mondiant product. I'm teaching three class. classes based on Mondiant because um, we had defensive measures like firewalls, antivirus, intrusion detection system, and application whitelisting, for example. If you uh, take um, Miko Hyponic's product, F Secure, antivirus, and put it on your machine, that really works because it turns your machine into an iPad. If you run that on Windows, it will not let you run any software that is not recognized good commercial software, which is what you should be doing at your company, like a group policy and such with software exclusion. You should not let people bring in some game from home and run it. They should have to run only approved things in the approved versions. And uh, if that's included in F-Secure by default, and if you don't turn it off, that's really quite effective. Nothing will run except something that is recognized by something like an MD5 hash of really being the genuine commercial product. So I mean, that, that's one way to go. However, none of these things will ultimately save you. And that is the thing we wanted. That's what the Chinese proved to us all when they hacked Google in 2010. You can have all the defensive measures you want, and they will not work. By the way, this is also nothing new. Some of your employees will betray you. Some of them will steal from coworkers. Some of them will get sick when you need them. Some of them will jump ship and work for the competition. There have always been these problems, and there's nothing you can do to prevent it. You can limit the amount of it with prevention measures, but ultimately prevention will fail, just as why we have fire alarms, right? We have all kinds of defense measures, but sooner or later, something's going to catch on fire, and then we're going to wish we had a response plan. So you have to have an instant response team, and you have to have network security monitoring to try to detect the bad things when they happen, and have a team that can cope with it. Most small businesses can't have their own team, so they outsource it. But the, um, so it's really no different than it ever has been. We're just admitting the truth. Just like every other aspect of security, your, your check billing, your accounts receivable department knows that some of your customers are not going to pay, and some of your employees are going to find ways to get paid twice and steal some money. That's just part of business. And instead of like freaking out and hiring some magic wand that's going to prevent it, you have audits where you check, all right, who's been stealing from the hill? Where's it going? You have to track them down. So that's, that's, it's really nothing to lose sleep over. Now, there's not any different than it's ever been. I feel better now. I hope so. <laughs> yeah. but, you know, on the same line, though, yeah. if you look at Android and you say you're working in Android, yeah. The move in Android is more and more apps by by less and less sophisticated app designers. And the same so thing, the problem is multiplying. And the same thing with the Internet of Things, which is responsible yes. for a lot of these botnets. Um, we are in a society that likes pretty shiny things, 
and doesn't want to worry about the details. And that is why the first version of anything is generally crap. Like, you may remember uh, the USB stick, those would be pretty fun. I caught a survey about four years ago, top C level executives, and the average C level executive, as of like five years ago, owned 20 USB sticks and had lost 15. Well, that's me too. And they're all full of company data, lying around everywhere, proprietary stuff just all over the place. Um, so there became a push maybe five or six years ago. People became aware of this and they wanted to encrypt the USB sticks. And there was a big generation of encrypted USB sticks for sale, and then the ethical hackers and forensic analysts took a look at them, and most of them were not encrypted. All they did was add software that runs when you plug them in a Windows machine that asks you for a password. But if you plug them into a Linux machine, or just take a disk image with a forensic tool, it's all just right there. There was one brand, Iron Key, which is well known, which made it physically, which was really encrypted. But they, yes, like it should be, you really couldn't steal from the Iron Key, and it only cost two or three times as much. It was also so strong you could drive a truck over it, and that's you know, sort of like those tough books. It was for serious people, and that was really encrypted, but most of the rest were not encrypted. But does that mean they're useless? It doesn't really, because the average thief will just plug it in a Windows machine and try to read it, and when that doesn't work, they'll give up. So that's like your antivirus. It stops some attacks, and that's all any defense ever does, it stops some attacks. If the KGB, wherever it is now, GRU or something, wants in, if the NSA wants in, they're getting it. There's nothing you can possibly buy or do that will stop them. And, and you have to define your threat model. Who is it you're really worried about? Who is it that you can afford to stop that would benefit your business? And a certain amount of attackers are going to get in, and you just have to accept that. So, and that's no different than it ever has been in the physical world. It's been four years. Anyway, um, one question. Yeah, go ahead. I'm just curious. What is so important? What is the big concern? Why is Congress getting involved with using Kaspersky software yeah. in government machines? What's the well, deal? I actually think they're right about that. Uh, the problem with antivirus is the antivirus owns your machine right down to the kernel, right down the system account. The antivirus has complete access to everything on your machine. And Kaspersky is a Russian product. They've said for years they don't want us using Chinese chips, no one's using Chinese routers and switches because we're hostile with China and we're hostile with Russia. So they certainly could put malware in Kaspersky and we would never know. Now, haven't, haven't the, the US antivirus companies um, sent their actual uh, code over to Russia? No. That was source code is proprietary. That was, that was a quote in the, in the press. Yeah, well, there is there is an issue here. So, and Kaspersky, I think, is offered to let people audit their source code, and that might help, but that's a huge job. But we haven't gone the other way. Uh, I don't know. Maybe they have. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. In, in agreement with you, Sam, um, the FBI had a talk on this, and he specifically addressed it. Yeah. And the key is, if you look at a risk, you're looking at you know likelihood and then impact. Right. And they're emphasizing the impact about owning it down to the kernel yeah. Eugene Kaspersky um, graduated from a university that's well known for producing um, what was formerly KGB, GRU yeah. type okay. agents. Okay. There's no reason to concretely suspect him or his organization of being malefactors or nefarious. Right. However, um, the fact that he could be compromised somehow, a loved one or somebody in his organization sure. at, the, at the highest levels, the government <laughs> just doesn't think it's wise with so many other competent products out there. And it really is a crying shame for those of you who technically respect the spirits. Well, but is that, that went through InfraGuard and the FBI channels when they did a little bit of a road show. Okay. And they, they hit those yeah. very points that Sam was talking about. Oh, I, I think he's right. Also, I should say, you know, five years ago, Kaspersky's son was kidnapped by monsters. And the Russian oh. government and military got it. So he is hand in glove with their military. By the way, Microsoft and AT&T are hand in glove with the U.S. Department. Remember when he, the, um, the Bush administration went to AT&T and said, please hand over the entire internet back internet background <coughs> traffic and all the telephone traffic unfolded without a search warrant. And that's completely illegal. Well, they didn't even look. They just gave it to him. It's all the fiber optic tack down the street. And then 10 years later, they were retroactively pardoned for that. Effectively, saying they couldn't be prosecuted for it. But the fact is, our companies would totally do this for the government. Right. We know they would. Right. So why do we think the Russian companies wouldn't do it for their government, especially since over there they have no independence, no rights. I mean, they could just come and point a gun to Kaspersky and say, you're putting malware in that stuff or I'm pulling the trigger. 
and they can pretty well get away with it over there. Over here, it'd have to be just a little bit more solid. <laughs> <laughs> but he understood. I mean, if you're a big company and the government is your number one customer, like Microsoft, you do whatever they say, and then you pretend to complain about the NSA over here to like put on a false face. But I mean, right. when the government comes over, you buy down because you want them to buy another 100 million Windows machines next year. <laughs> so I mean, it's a uh, Anyway, I don't, I don't know how long you want me to go. This is taking longer than I thought. When, how long does this thing go, Doug? Janelle? <laughs> I, I, you could go another 20 minutes or so okay. if you'd like. Let me see what's the most fun to show you here. Oh, I think well, this is fun. Do you have anything else out there? No. no. Okay, then you could go longer so than that. So let me sure. ask you any requests. Yeah, the questions are good. Yeah. And I got a lot of other stuff to show. I brought more than I needed because one time I came here and there wasn't enough. So I brought a lot. It doesn't really matter. But I think, I think okay. Hacking with Ollie Debug is a good old script kitty trick you guys ought to see. So, um, <coughs> let's play a little bit with the debugger. All right. So I'm going to get putty.exe. And I'm going to, okay, so putty is just a harmless piece of Windows software. You probably all used it. And I got an old version, which we are going to um, mess with, and I will complain about it. Maybe some of you Windows Microsoft experts can help me understand why it is as stupid as it is. Um, so here's Putty. Uh, let's see. I saved another one in downloads. Looks like all those have been modified. There's Putty. I'm going to copy it, paste it on my desktop. And there it is, putty.exe on my desktop. OK. I'm going to make another copy of it right away. All right. So let's run Putty. And what Putty does is just makes you connect two machines. So I connect to like one of my machines on SSH, and then when I, come on, stop messing with me, okay. When I open, a host does not exist, so I spell it wrong, or I'm off the network, let's see. Buddy, it's the like ad.sams.info, and I think I've got a dot there, all right. I'm gonna shrink it to hit this. All right. Do you have internet just, connectivity? Maybe I'm off the, oh, I am off the network. Oh, that'll do it. They're currently not connected. Well, let's fix that. Okay, up here. Well, that's the match. This one might as well be disconnected. This one will be that. Let's um, go here. More of good old Microsoft makings. Okay. Let's disable that one I'm not using. Disable that one. Okay, we're supposed to turn gray. Turn gray. I just got it. Mm -hmm. it. Well, it's just able just to just hit turn gray. That's not good. I'm going to enable it. Okay, then it should get an IP address and everything. Let's see if I have the ability to like hand it over to create a middle situation. A lot of customer data is hacked. Maybe you should say how to fix it. Oh, you know, no, I don't know. I just try to be config. That's, you know, I couldn't get, oh yeah, look at that. Everything's still dis disabled. So you just, okay. I'm going to restart the machine. We'll see if that helps. If not, free with it. Um, I may just move on to something else, but I appear to have nuked my network piece on how that machine. Um, this malware is relatively harmless, but of course, with real malware, you expect it's not since you're destroying the machine. So you have a safe state and you keep going back to it before you put any malicious on it. Oh, good. Sign of life. There we go. Well, no, we might be waiting 15 seconds. Of course, we do not have any product. Because I don't. That's one other reason to use this version. This is before Microsoft actually enforced the product keys. <coughs> Sam, are you doing any consulting on crypto currencies? A lot of them have been hacked lately. Well, I don't know about being hacked. I certainly am doing a lot of work on them. Well, not particularly consulting, but they certainly are. Uh, they're generally terrible. Uh, if you have any good articles about being hacked, too, I'd like to see them. Yeah. Yeah, um, actually, the cryptocurrency itself isn't being hacked so much as the keys that, that are in their wallet are being hacked in unsecured networks. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, that's, that's, that's cool. Cool. There's some like 483. And Every day there's a new one. <clears throat> Let's enable this one. Maybe I just disabled the wrong one here. I'll do this in the test. Let's see if any of them are going anywhere. It's a good reason. We're currently connected. You just bought a Bitcoin and you're eight years ago. Right. Or you have a new one of them. Well, 
much annoying. <laughs> well, this is your game, I'm going to try to leave. Here, I have one. Well, uh, oh, I think I know what's going on. It's connected to the wrong machine out there. There's a way to do it, um, a virtual network editor or something. I'll probably quitting VM coming back might help. See, it, I, when I've lost VMware, no, nah, it's always connected to just this network, but I mean, that's not such a brilliant idea. See, sometimes VMware tries to go out the wrong adapter. But in this case, there's only one active adapter. It's disconnected, and I should see something happening here. Uh, well, I could also do it in bridge mode. That would really be interesting. Connect it again. All right, I may not be able to show you much of this. won't be much fun without anything to connect to. I could start a NetCat. Listen, I won't work for SSH. IP config? No networks at all. Oh, really? <laughs> um, could you call a second thing? Huh? Well, Linux, I know what to do. Did I know? The network is experiencing drive or hardware related issues. <laughs> that would seem to be a little odd. Um, neat. <clears throat> Make sure your internet protocol bindings are correct. Yeah, I'd say they are. <coughs> repair it. <laughs> I can't repair that. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of doubt it. All right, let me see if I got anything I can do without networking. Sam, I got so, so a quick question. Yeah. Do you have mini cats or Metasploit on your machine? Um, yes. Uh, would you be willing to show the contents of your LSAS container yeah, uh, sure. to yeah. demonstrate privilege escalation? Yeah, but I don't know how to do that without uh, any networking. Well, your LSAS container is a, just a process running on your machine. It is. So any credentials you've ever put in there. You know how to spot it on here? Well, Mimikatz is generally part of Metasploit, but right, you can't Metasploit be... on Windows. I've only got it on Linux. Well, okay. Um, and if I could make a session to this one, I could uh, dump the SAS sequence. I might have King. King can do it, right? Well, yeah, you can you can dump the you can dump the memory and then yeah, I don't have King. Run uh, Mimikatz against the memory <clears throat> dump of LSAS. Actually, I'm afraid. Um, there's one thing I can do. I'm going to show you, Sam, before yeah. you do that, what were you going to do with SSH? Just I was going to modify PUT. We're going to take PUT. I'm sorry, PUT. Yeah, if I, if I get PUT working, then I show you how to modify it in a debugger. You can find the cart that prints out a message. You can change the assembly code. You can change it to print out a different message. And then you can add malware to it and run the malware inside PUT. Oh, and one of the wow. many entertaining things is, if you look in PuTTY, this version of PuTTY is signed, but the signature does not. You can modify it and it continues to work. And I've been to talks where they talk about modifying signed Windows executables, and I don't know exactly what's wrong with this version of PuTTY, but I know other Windows executables, when they sign them, they don't actually sign all of it. There's like six sections and it only signs three of them, and you can put malware in the other three sections and the signature won't stop. Which so if I pay a 50 bucks, will it spy on my ex-girlfriend? Sure, or do anything you want. Wow. Yeah, so how do, you detect, <laughs> how do you detect which ones are not signed? Um, well, normally, a signed executable will have a tab here to tell you that in the properties. If you go to properties, here's the digital signature. And here it tells you the signature is OK. But when I modify it, so signatures so when I modify it, I can run it, and I can add malware to it and run it. So the lack of being signed does not stop it from running, which is mighty strange, and I don't know what the point is. He speaks that in the newer version by now. There, this is not the latest version. The latest version, I don't think these tricks would work. Anyway, I've got plenty of things. Let me try showing you this Android stuff, because that will work without a network. And um, it's also good stuff to know. I have to go to um, basic. Here, I'll tell you where it is. That's where it's on the phone. It is in Summoners. Okay. So 
the website, seminars, a bunch of other stuff I'm not going to have time for, which is all right. Just don't like to bore people. Um, there are seminars. There they are. Okay, they'll probably be the most recent modified thing. Yeah. All right. Um, that's not what I want. That's the proposal to do it. There we are. Okay. So I got slides here. This is the kind of thing that works when the network is not working. Okay. So. Okay. All right, I showed this, I gave this talk at DEF CON, so you guys know who I am, I teach at City College. <coughs> so, here is a problem. If you log in, say in your browser, and you go to someplace like Facebook, and then you come back tomorrow and restart your machine, you don't want to log in again. So there's a box there that says, remember me. And how does it remember you? It remembers because you have a cookie. Right? And the cookie doesn't have your password or anything stupid in it. It's just a random number. And somewhere on Facebook's server, there's a database, and they know that random number means you. This is the standard <coughs> way to do it. We've all been doing it this way for decades. Uh, it works just fine. And it's reasonably secure. Even if I'm sloppy with that cookie and send it over the network without a cookie and all that, the only thing that could happen is somebody else getting your Facebook account. They can't get in all their other accounts because all they have is a Facebook cookie, which is just a random number. And that's fine. And that's what works in browsers everywhere, except on your phone. For some ungodly reason, phone developers do not do it that way. So if you have a, now you know if you have a Windows XP machine and you have a login password and you turn off the machine, how many copies of that password are on the machine? Anybody know? Two, three, zero. Oh, it's, a, it's only stored in a hashed form which is intended to be hard to crack. Now, Windows hashes are appalling, and they're 100 million times easier to crack than they should be because they haven't updated them since 1992. But it at least hashed. If you do all the strings on that machine, not one of them has your password. And that's by design. But if you have an Android phone with 50 apps, there are 30 copies of your password on it. For no reason at all, except develop, Android developers are just the scum of the earth. And they don't, they not only know nothing about security, they don't even understand how stupid they are, and none of their management understands either. They just outsource the development to the cheapest third-party, third-world developer they can find, I guess, and they just take everything, and it appears to work. They call it good and keep going. And if you actually look at what it's doing, it is appalling. It's the kind of thing that would be totally unacceptable in MS-DOS or Windows 95 as too insecure. What about iOS? Same iOS is much, much better. Okay. Because the FBI <coughs> went six years ago to Apple, and they said, look, the number one fastest growing theft in the world is people stealing iPhones. Can't you lock them down so the crook can't get in? So they locked them down. Then a few years later, the FBI said, hey, you want to get in this phone? And they said, we hate you so much. You told us to lock it down. And now you want to get in. <laughs> we hate you. <laughs> and, it, and that's what we do. The last two versions of iOS are so secure, there is no, no way to get in at all. So even if your developer stores everything on the phone in plain text, it's okay, because nobody knows any way to get the data off that phone. They did find a way. They did. They found a hack of it. It's not publicly known. They paid a yeah. million bucks for a private exploit, right. and right. they can only work on older phones. Yeah, like the 5C. That 5S or something. No, so, the 5C, which is even older. Yeah, yeah. So we, the current phones, uh, there's no public jailbreak at all, and no public exploit that will let you see the data on there. I can't even audit iOS apps to see what they're saving, which means the crook couldn't steal it anyway. So... So iOS is much bigger. Most, the safest computing platform you can get is iOS, either the iPhone or the iPad. It is essentially malware-free because it's almost impossible to get any malware on it because you cannot install anything except from the store. There are no browser plugins like Flash and Java, and all the stuff in the store is heavily vetted. And it, occasionally, malware appears in the Apple store, and they kick it out. They punish those developers and kick them out forever, and that's a harsh punishment. So there's really, they're very safe. They're also very limited. But, but they're very safe. So anyway, Target does this right. I've been trying, uh, lately I've been doing retail apps. I, a few years ago, I did all the top 10 banks, insurance companies, and stockbrokers, and they're pretty appalling. But um, I, I did, just time I was talking to the top retailers, and went down and got Target's one of the top retailers. So if you install Target Australia, it's one of their Android apps, it's just one that I went to the most thorough investigation of. Um, if you log in, you can watch the network traffic, you can run your phone through a proxy, which is what I did here, uh, the VERT proxy. It uses HTTPS, which is correct, so this is all encrypted, and you send up your username and your password. 
to the server. This is the right way to do it. You log in with your name and password going through an encrypted channel. And after that reaches the server and it decides that that's a good password, it gives you a response. And the response has this token, which is just a long random number. And as far as I can tell, this is not a base 64 encoded version of your name or your password or anything. It's just a random number, which is what it should be. And now that's what's saved on your phone. So next time you come back, it looks at that random number. And Target is the only person on Earth to whom that means anything. Staples is bad. So I tested the Staples version in January this year on the Staples app, and I looked at the local storage, and I saw this thing called encrypted password. Now, right now, I can stop and say they are idiots. <laughs> yeah. I don't know anything about the encrypted password before. When I did my previous analysis of the top financial apps, if I found things like this, I would not report it as a vulnerability because I wasn't prepared to go to the effort of trying to break their encryption. But this is already wrong. It should just be a random code. There is no reason for any kind of encrypted password to be stored in the memory space of that app on their, on their Android phone. So I can pretty much assume that they're idiots in that they did this at all. But, you know, that I'm not going to be able to submit a vulnerability report like that. I need to be able to prove that I can really recover the password. So, here, by the way, is a, a pretty good blog I found from a couple of years ago talking about how to do this. If you want to store passwords on the phone, the best procedure is don't. Knock it off, use a cookie. What are you, an idiot? Mm -hmm. However, if somehow you have to store a password on the phone and you won't let go of this stupid idea, then you use the Android keychain. That's what it's for. It's an encrypted storage for your secrets built into iOS and Android has a version. And it's sitting right there. If you won't do that because you're too stupid to realize you do these things, you can encrypt it with a public key. And ever since 1974, we've had this miracle called public key encryption. You can encrypt stuff with a public key and make this garbled mess and nobody can read it except the holder of the private key, which is on your server. So it doesn't matter who steals it or anything. It only means the only person who can understand it would be target. Um, or you can do this, which is the most popular thing phones do now. A lot of them did before was just store plain text on the phone. Now for some reason that's gone out of style. So now they do this. They encrypt it with private key encryption and then they try to hide the key somewhere on the phone. However, I can read your source code in Android, so you really can't hide that key from me very well. Even if you thought that was a good idea, which it emphatically is not. In fact, it is not that hard to find the key at all. So I have option four is for some reason the most popular solution. So here's the encrypted password. I learned a trick from the uh, Web App Hacker's Handbook, which is good, clean, fun. If you suspect that someone is an idiot and they don't understand encryption, which the mere presence of this implies these people do not understand encryption. Then, if they're really stupid, maybe they used um, textbook encryption. See, textbook encryption is called electronic codebook mode, where you have a block of input and a block of, of encrypted text. And if you have an identical block, second block of input, you get exactly the same answer. This is a very common mistake made. Microsoft made this mistake twice in different products. In I remember in Microsoft Office 2000, I found out that we were mailing files unencrypted at email attachments. And I said, oh, no, no, we can't be doing that. We'll put a Microsoft password on those Word documents. And then I discovered that was useless because Microsoft made the same mistake. So if you had two Word documents encrypted with the same password, you could just XOR them and a whole bunch of them would turn into plain text because there was no random. So you're supposed to add a random bit to each block so that if two blocks have identical input, they don't have identical output. But here's the test for that. Just have 32 A's and then a couple more characters to satisfy their password complexity requirement because the typical block size is 16 characters. And if that is true, then I can take this password, which is base 64, and I can decode it with Python here. And if I just line it up, you can see it's a block of stuff. This is 16 A's, this is the next 16 A's, this is the capital A123. So not only are they using a block cipher, they're using an electronic codebook mode, which I've proven here. So that's another mistake. But let's go all the way. You go that thing. Android apps are stored on the phone as a single APK file. You can just suck them off the phone with Android Debug Bridge that runs on Linux and Windows. Um, you can pull the APK file down and unpack it with a tool called APK Tool. And you see the source code in this language, Smalley, which is very close to Java. So it has things here like username. An encrypted password. So since I know the final result is stored of your name encrypted password, I just search for the text encrypted password. And I find the encrypted password is um, uses a module called GU and a module called M. 
because they ran through a stupid thing attempting to make it hard to read the source code, um, which is a waste of time. It changes some of the names to like GU and M, but it doesn't change the name of the variables or the important modules. So it's like a security guard that locks half the doors and it goes on. So here's the key for your Staples encryption. It takes the brand name of your phone, the device identifier, the model number, the serial number, and then the name of the package, and combines them together in a string. Then it adds this, uh, for our security, it adds this thing, extra salt. Then it takes a SHA-1 hash of it, and then it takes the first 128 bits of that, and that is the AES encryption key. So that's how they hid the key on the phone. So all you have to do is I can go here to an online AES calculator, put in that key, put in all the A's, and I get the same pattern of hexadecimal that I got when I used a password starting with 32 A's. And from that, I, so I sent that to them. I notified them in January. They gave me an automated response saying, thank you for being concerned about our product. We'll get on that right away. They, they did nothing. So after, uh, the only reason I do this, this is complex, like putting a lock that I can easily pick on the Apple so I can say I did it, putting antivirus on so I can say I did it. I only tell companies so I can say I did it. Because people think there's something wrong with you if you just dump all the bullies right out of the world. And I must say, if you were to find like a Microsoft vulnerability, they actually listen. I found one a few years ago, and I talked to Doug, and he talked to a Microsoft security guy, and within like two days, somebody at Microsoft security told me what they were going to do. They said, we don't care, we're not going to fix it. I said, okay, but at least they are idiots. But when you call those companies, there's just nobody at the other end. They have no idea what you're talking about. They just throw away your emails. They have no security team at all. They can't understand what you're talking about. You're just wasting your time. But you do it so that you can say you did it. That's why I always keep records. I told them, they ignored me, then they become home. This is what I do. After 30 days, I give up on them. They gave these guys something like 60 or 90 days. And then I wrote homework for my students. This is how I ramp up the humiliation. Um, <laughs> <laughs> homework is stealing a credit card out of my Staples account. <coughs> and uh, I made a video of how to do it. Um, here's the complete key exposure. First, the proof of electronic codebook mode, and then the complete key exposure. I made some video <coughs> on YouTube. And I made homework for my students where they're stealing the... Uh, uh, then I went to Washington, D.C. to give a talk to government officials about security, and when I tried to demonstrate it there, this box popped up. In May, they finally fixed it. All this humiliation finally got to them. Uh, by the way, that one I told Microsoft about like five years ago, they told me they weren't going to fix it. And three years later, I killed Windows 2012 on stage at DEF CON before like 3,000 people. And within one hour after that talk, one of the Microsoft engineers in the front row texted me, what was that command? Right, they finally fixed it. <laughs> there's just a level of humiliation when they say, all right, we'll fix it. Anyway, um, so what they did here is now they put on the very thinnest mandate. They made it so that if you're running on a rooted phone, it won't store your password. Now, all this means is you have to unroot your phone, save the password, root your phone, and seal the password, I imagine. But I haven't bothered to do that yet. So it is true that the exact technique I told them about won't work anymore. That's what you call a patch. And this is the vulnerability description of this. We have patched the vulnerability report. And so this is what you usually get. And this is why if you look at the security reports, it is the usual story. I notified the company, and then two months later they patched it, and I tested it, and there was a way around the patch, so they had to patch it again, and I tested it, and there was a way around the patch, and finally, like a third or fourth time, they actually patched it in a way that stopped my attack. But, you know, they, they really don't care, but they're trying to make me shut up. They also sent me a letter telling me, you should take down those videos now because you're violating the terms of service. I said, terms of service? No, I didn't even look at them. And when you open the terms of service, the app, it said, you cannot reverse engineer to this app. No, 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 you will not look under the hood. You should say that that implies consent that you will never check the security of it. Only bad people would do that. So I asked my lawyer, and he said, they can't say that. They can't tell you you're not allowed to look at the product you're using. They can say that. What's that? They can say it. They can say it. They can say it. So I asked him, I have a real risk. And he said, no, you don't have to take down videos. They're out there. Mine, reverse engineering is fair use. So, how do we do? So, so, yeah. So, what about malware? We talked about um, yeah. Have you got? Have you already addressed that? No. Uh, there's a ton of malware on the phone, but I haven't started analyzing Android malware. Which is no, funny. What about the, the ransomware issues? Uh, there's only a little ransomware for Android, but a lot more for Windows. And um, I haven't addressed it in particular. Um, oh, you mean rever re reverse the encryption of ransomware? Well, I already can't sleep at night because there's no antivirus and there's no solution here. So now I've got this next problem, which is ransomware. Right, and the solution is backups. Okay. 
And just like you already know, you could turn on your machine tomorrow and the hard drive could be dead. Right. You could turn it on tomorrow and give you ransomware. You should have backups. Right. That's your answer. So that's the only solution. The college got hit with ransomware and we didn't pay because we had backups. Ah. If, if you have backups, I mean, you should have backups anyway. But I, I mean, I know I was the same as everybody else. I lost my thesis six times. I was writing a PhD thesis. I think you have to get hurt like six times and then you learn to back. <laughs> but at some point, you all have to. I had a student that's mad about this. You backup for everything all the time. He's right, you know. It should be like number two or three on your to do list to make sure you have backups of whatever you're doing. And if you do, then who cares? They give you ransomware. You start from backups, keep them. That's a, that's a good answer. Anyway, so um, there's Ace from McDonald's and Menard who just have plain text passwords are still on the phone. Like that right there, and you can steal from the root phone easily, um, which is pretty ridiculous, but there's that. Um, Sam, what, what can you do? If you got McDonald's or Ace Hardware's pa uh, password. Oh, that's a good point. There are two things you can do. First thing you can do is use a different password for every app. So that if they steal your password, they're not getting any other accounts like your email. Password reuse is what most people do, and it's very dangerous. The second thing you can do is put a VPN on your phone, and that will put another layer of encryption on the network transmission that's under your control. So at least then you'll be protected if they're sending over the network and play text. But the, the general thing you should have is a password manager, so you really have a different password for every site. And then you lower your risk down to about the level of cookie. The only reason why the password is a risk is because everyone uses the same password for everything. So your McDonald's password, that doesn't matter, would also put people in your email and your bank and stuff like that. Whoever gets in your email typically owns your whole life because they can do password resets. Yeah, but, but wait, sorry. Yeah. So if I log into your McDonald's, yeah. You know, account. What can I do? Order right. hundred quarter pounders. Uh, I think you can do some of that. You can also spend my prizes I won on whatever the contest is. So nothing too bad. So I mean, that's why I say if they would just use a cookie, I wouldn't complain. Mm -hmm. And then stealing the cookie would just get me in your McDonald's account, and that's reasonable. But the point is, they endanger you because people reuse passwords. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. One thing about using a different password everywhere. If you're not using a password manager. Yeah. Don't think that I'm going to have this core password yeah. and then I'm going to have a little bit of variance. Maybe I'll base it off of something on the site and use two, three, or four characters because yeah. that's not very much entropy. Once they crack one password, it's trivial to go into John the Ripper or any other password cracking program. Use that as a base and then oh, yeah. you're only trying to defeat three to five characters of entropy. What I recommend you do instead is if you're going to do something like that and not use a password manager, make sure it's much longer and you're trying to get past number uh, 27 characters. Because once you, the, the magic numbers you need to remember are 27 and 14, above 14, and there's no way a Windows is going to chop your password into two seven byte pieces. But and above 27, uh, crackers like John the Ripper really diminish in their ability to be able to brute force your password. However, that 14 is now obsolete, thank God. Unless you're using Server 2003, there's no, no supported Windows product that will do that anymore, unless you're running XP Embedded. I can show you a 2008 R2. 2008 R2 has... 2008, 2008 R2. By default? Not, not, not necessarily by default. Have. Your administrator has to know how to disable that feature. Really? If they do that, they're okay. They have but if they disable. don't... No one hashes are back on. They turned them off in Vista. The landman hashes will exist if your password 14 wow. characters or less, and the network setting is to allow land. Not on my 2008, before R2. And it's just full of empty places. I, I would love to go offline with you. Yeah, looks like you're like talking about that. Work that together. That's awful. You can show me where they are, that's wrong. So, so, yeah. so what do you do? Just remember a lot of phrases like the, the quick brown fox jumps over the, the lazy dog? Well, I, I, I don't mean to steal from there, but no, this, this came out in June. Yeah. <laughs> we have, uh, SP 863A, yeah. and they said well, the advice we gave you back in 2003 was the exact opposite of what you should do because what it's led to do is it's made passwords hard for you to remember right. and to implement, right. yet trivial for yeah. complex crackers to crack. Yeah. Right. So, what length is more important than complexity? Use white space, use punctuation, and if you're not using a password manager, which takes some of the burden off you, but does put your all, all your eggs in one basket, right. you just find something that's meaningful to you, like and there are any number of schemes to do that. You can do the green idea sleep furiously route. There's no way even today's AIs would figure that out. You right. know, 
It's syntactically correct, but it doesn't mean anything. Yeah, but I got a hundred different things. Yeah, now these things you should do, I'll just write them down somewhere. You already know how to secure pieces of paper. Write it down somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Again, you can do that variation. You can do the, I've got a core 20 word passphrase that I use, mm -hmm. and then I vary it by 10 characters. Now I've got a 30 character passphrase okay. that's going to be very hard to crack. You're vulnerable if they get to 20 because now they've only got 10 characters of entropy. Right. So the longer you're willing to make it, the more secure you are, but be sensible. Categorize sites you go to in buckets. Okay, there are buckets where you just have information you're retrieving. Make those your trivial password. Right. Don't put any energy. Right. Do this only for the places where you keep your crown jewels. Greater than 27 characters. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's just... Uh, it's just yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. And this is all good information. Well, exactly. and, and, and since we brought it up about password managers, yeah. but, I mean, why do we trust, you know, LastPass? Um, I use LastPass. They got hacked. They fixed the phone. Nothing's ever perfect. You've, you've always got some risk. Um, if you want to be, I could carry on a piece of paper with them all written down, then I could be shouted by physical security. Right. Uh, you have to have a record somewhere. I prefer password manager, that seems to be convenient. Uh, the main reason I started using different password in each cycle is not this is because I saw all the servers that got hacked. So I know that they're just throwing around like an idiot at the other. <laughs> so there's no point trusting that Yahoo is not going to leave my password. It's abundantly clear they lose them all the time. So I really want a different password there than I have in other zones. So Sam, yeah. did you see on TV they were selling password manager? Yeah, book. Which that was, was a book. Yeah. Yeah, just a book. That was, that's, that was a long time. Yeah. And, and, and that's 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 like, yeah. DeGeneres came up with password manager manager, yeah, yeah. which was a which was a lock box. There you go. <laughs> you yeah. box and, and you put it into a box and you lock it. You know, this reminds me, Dan Kaminsky, one of the famous ethical hacker in the world, about three years ago before Jeff Con, they hacked. They hacked into his research box and dumped out all his passwords, and all these passwords followed the pattern. It was fuck Yahoo, fuck Google, fuck you. <laughs> so, you know, that was one of those patterns that he said you shouldn't have a pattern like that. But he didn't freak out even. He was talking, he said, Well, you know, there's the same thing I've been telling you about the advanced resistance threats. You know, people are going to get in, they got my password, what do you do? Change it and go on. Yeah. Anyway, so 7 uh, Eleven and Trader Joe's fan, not from Trader Joe, uses a plain text login. And uh, you just steal off the wire with anything that can monitor network traffic because it's HTTP. Mm -hmm. so quite a few of them do that. Oh, so. But this is one. Now, I don't understand why, but a lot of people will not fix plain text storage or plain text transmission, but they will usually fix this one. So I went, uh, my department had made me go to a really, really boring faculty meeting, so they were telling us something totally useless. So I just went to the back and plugged in and started testing the security of apps. <laughs> and I went through all the Amazon apps. And the Amazon apps from Amazon are really quite good because, as you might expect, Amazon are not idiots any more than Microsoft is these days. Like long ago, they were really sloppy about security and they really cleaned up. So I couldn't find anything wrong with any of the Amazon apps with my simple tests. But this thing is not from Amazon. It's a price tracker for Amazon by Technotic Solutions. And what this thing does is it gets your Amazon password and logs into Amazon and checks the price of the, uh, of the product and it waits for the price to fall and then alerts you when the price has fallen to where you want it to be. So it's handling your Amazon credentials, but it's not an Amazon app. And it breaks SSL. But if you run it through a man in the middle attack on SSL and give it a fake certificate, it will just send the data with the wrong encryption key without complaining. This is a very common thing that apps do, something like my experience, something like 15% of Android apps do this, and not a small amount of iOS apps either, because uh, the developers apparently don't understand SSL, or they don't want to bother installing a test certificate, so they just turn that off and never turn it back on. So I notified the developer. I said, dude, your app breaks SSL. By the way, this is probably illegal in America. Two companies were punished by the FTC for this in 2014. Credit Karma and Fandango did this. And they were sanctioned by the FTC, and they said, if you have, in the terms of service, where it says, we will take reasonable measures to protect your privacy, and then you break SSL, that's not good enough, and they got punished. I think Lenovo just got nailed, too. That again? Yeah, that was for malware, the one I saw. But maybe that's SSH, too. Well, what they do is they install all this yeah, stuff on your... Yeah, yeah, that was just fine with malware. But Android does the same thing. You buy an Android phone, you got all this crap on it. You know? That's true. Anyway, so I contacted the developer. And he didn't ignore me like he usually do. He replied right away. He said, yeah, that's right. I break SSL. I just put that in the latest version. Do you like it? I'm like, dude. <laughs> he said, yeah, you know what was happening? People are getting error messages. And they couldn't connect and stuff. 
And I said, what's that about? So I turned off that encryption crap. Now it works great. <laughs> I'm like, <"That's> true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Go to the advanced settings of the app. You'll find this page that says, don't change anything beyond this point. But if you go past that page, you can turn it back on. <laughs> but what would you want to do that for? I'm like, dude. <laughs> 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 I said, no, you can't be just turning off essential security features of the operating system and not even telling the user and making it the default. Dude! <laughs> and so he said, well, I'll fix it. But then he never did. So here he is being homework and humiliation and stuff. Um, so, and these are the guys that store your password with what Microsoft would call reversible encryption. Remember they used to do that too? Back in the bad old days of Ellen hashes. Um, they store it with stupidity. Almost always ADS, where they hide the key somewhere. All these guys do it. I told them. They don't care. They don't understand. So anyway, I got pretty fed up with this stuff. Home decoder, the local password encrypted. There's how you suck it from the phone and find the password. They're almost all using AES, this which is a perfectly fine encryption routine for private key encryption, but private key encryption is useless for the use case of storing it on your phone because you have to put the key somewhere. They should be using public key encryption, but apparently these developers have never heard of it um, and don't know what to do. So I can just find the key and I can de totally decrypt them with Python. It only takes a few lines of Python to decrypt any of these things. There's Kroger and Safeway and Walgreens. Um, and here's ones that do a lot of them, even all three of these. And here's the three people that actually fixed it. Morgan Chase, Options House, and Golf Galaxy actually fixed these things. Option House took two years to fix the uh, broken SSL. Um, JP Morgan Chase removed it from the log. They often dump the password in the log, by the way. The machine has a syslog which is available to every app on the phone, and they, a lot of them just put your passwords right in the log. Wow. It's really clear that what you see in many cases is just a beta test app that went, they just sold it that way because the developer doesn't care, and the customer apparently doesn't audit security of their apps at all, because these are very simple tests. I'm not doing anything deep. But anyway, I thought, so I got fed up with this nonsense, with all these passwords on the phone, and I decided to teach an encryption. Because it is abundantly clear that not any of these developers have the slightest clue what they're doing the encryption. They're sort of just like a, a child hitting typewriter keys with a hammer. They have no clue what they're doing. And so, just a teaching a cryptography course, we're using cryptocurrency as the uh, as one of the source of projects. You learn their stuff. And I said, there are people that are developing cutting edge cryptography, and that is not what this course is about. And there are people who are really learning a lot of math, and that's not what it's about. I just want you to learn how to correctly apply the standard methods, like RSA and AES, and SHA. If you could just correctly use the standard functions, you'd be a mile ahead of these idiots writing apps. And uh, it is abundantly clear that all these companies cannot find a developer that knows a thing about encryption, and they don't even have an auditor at their company that knows anything about encryption. And so even, and for God's sake, don't make your own encryption. That is the kiss of death. <laughs> if anybody won't tell you what the encryption is, don't even touch the product because it's always something stupid. Because if you think you've thought of something new in the world of encryption, that just <laughs> This stuff has been perfected like hundreds of years ago by the number of theorists from Pythagoras and onward. If you have something brilliant you thought of in the shower, it's something Pythagoras thought of a few thousand years ago and somebody else cracked 1,500 years ago, and you're going to be humiliated when you sell a product using it. Just use the standard stuff. It's written by the smartest people on earth and use it correctly. And you'll be a whole lot better off. Anyway, that's what I wanted to show you about that. I think I've used up my time. Yeah. yeah. Question. So the, when you're doing the Android, your premise on that is you're able to get into the Android device so that you can suck the Right, so you have a root device. Which is, I use a virtual device. You can download Jenny Motion. It's a free Android emulator. runs on Windows and Mac and Linux. And it's rooted so you can install apps right from the store. And you can inspect the storage <coughs> and suck the apps right off the phone and turn them into source code. So, these are all standard things. People have been doing them since about 2012 or 13. There's no <coughs> path where they're basic. Android's not going to try to lock that down. Well, they have. Or, yeah. Some phones actually encrypt the phone yeah. in the latest versions. If you get the more expensive ones like the Galaxy, in the latest versions, some of them actually have encryption turned on. The iPhones have been encrypted since like iPhone 3S. Android is usually not encrypted though because they want to change the battery power. And so, um, if you get a very modern version of Android and one of the more expensive phones, like from Google, it probably will have full device encryption on it, and that would certainly be better. I haven't tested that. That would certainly be another variable. And it might even get to be as good as the iPhone, although I doubt it, but at least it would be better than the older Androids. But this is one of the horrible things about Android 
99% of all Android devices are more than two years behind on the patches. So just think about your Windows machine. If you haven't passed it in two years, it's garbage. There are hundreds of new attacks that will just take it over. That's the appalling thing. This Google is miles behind Microsoft, making all the same mistakes in the same order. They are just beginning to say, gee, you know, we should invent like some security update process where all the phones <laughs> actually get like a patch once a month or something like that. Yeah, that would be really cool if you could figure that out. But they haven't figured it out yet. So most phones never get updated. Yeah. Can you use your tool to take off bloatware like the NFL app that I can oh, sure. see you remove? Sure. Although, I should mention, the NFL app is the most secure app you can get. Because NFL was busted for plain text network transmissions, and they secured their app right past the Walmart test better than any banking app, any insurance app. <laughs> it's still, it's app. still bloatware. NFL, 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 NFL. I changed the NFL app at all. The next time you launch it, it says your app has to be up and updated before you can use it. You won't even touch their servers until you put on a genuine app. Yeah. So that's the most secure app on your phone. Photography <laughs> 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 Yeah, exactly. If you buy a t-shirt from the NFL, you're well protected. If you go to your bank or something, you're screwed. <laughs> so, so this requires physical access to the phone or, or a backup image? No. No. Those would do it. It also it would be equally good for me to just trick you into installing a malicious app on your phone. And, oh, and people good. install things that did not come from the Google store all the time. And even if they stick to the Google store, the Google store is all full of malware. Right. They are much less successful than Apple at removing malware because they're open source. You can put stuff in the store without telling them your real name. So when they kick you out, you can just take a new account and dump the crap back in again. Um, whereas Apple won't let you put anything in there without paying them money and proving who you are. And when they kick you out, they'll never let you back. And you could have really made money selling apps, so people have a strong incentive to not do that. Whereas Google has a toothless process of kicking you out and you just come back. It's like yeah. you off Facebook. Well, you make a new account, you're back. <laughs> and so uh, there's tons of malware in the Apple, in the Google store. Any particular? Do they have like a listing of the top, you know, ones? Is there like a website I can go to and say, oh, I better avoid these ten? There are. If there's any virus you can put on your Android phone, you should. Because um, um, because this is important to know. I mean, Windows it has more malware than anything else, 100 million viruses. Um, Google think there used to be a myth years ago, people said Linux is more secure than Windows. And then along came Google, and they proved that if you make a crappy enough Linux, it's not any better than Windows, and that's Android. Yeah. And in fact, it's more like older versions of Windows uh, because there are no real defenses in it. Uh, yeah, so I, 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 there are 100 million Windows viruses and 1 million Android viruses. I've got 10 antiviruses running on this, oh, and, I wouldn't want and they all say they're going to get rid of SD host, and they don't. Yeah, well, well. anyway, running antivirus on your Android phone is a good thing. Um, but nothing's uh -huh. perfect. Um, and I don't have a very good answer. Android phones uh, are pretty miserable things. And the only reason I run Android and Windows is as targets. If you want to be safe, get an Apple. Uh, uh, they might throw us out of here for things like that, but I mean, that's... Uh, the only thing I found out is when my, when my extended family all had Windows, I never got to see them every single Thanksgiving and everything. I went over there and spent all day fixing their machine. So I told them all to get Macs, and now I get to talk to them. <laughs> <laughs> a normal human being is not kept, not competent to operate a Windows machine. Every time I see them, these things are popping up. I don't know what they mean. I installed these five things, and now there's more things popping up. What does it all mean? Like, Buy a Mac is what it means. And then a normal human can actually operate a Mac for like years at a time without needing help. <coughs> Um, I think I've run out of things. Anybody have a question, Sam? Yeah. I have a question about AI, deep learning, and robots. Deep learning? Uh, let's say 